Okay. Hopefully she'll be okay now. She was, um, she doesn't like it when there are people outside. Um, I posted when the final exam is. It's at 9.30 in the morning on the 17th. Um, and it's two hours. Um, so I posted that information on the homepage. Um, I, we will be doing the quiz in a bit. It's on chapter eight. Uh, should be fairly simple for you guys. Um, and I am going to pick up with where I left off. Let's see. Okay. Okay, so we ended up uh, the other day, we ended up uh, on this where we were talking about um, uh, a hot piece of metal in uh, cold water and how you would calculate the uh, energy. Um, and we said that energy is conserved, so whatever heat the metal loses is what is gained by the water. And um, we will move on. Um, I'm going to do this first problem for you. Whoops, sorry. I'm going to do this first problem for you. I, you'll notice I have posted this PowerPoint. And for the most part, I've put answers down here on the bottom of each slide. So any problems that we don't do in class, you can do. And you have the answer uh, written for you. Occasionally, I have not written an answer for um, some of them because I um, I want you to think about the answer and if you have any questions so you can let me know. So we're going to do this first one. Um, a 70 gram piece of metal at 80 degrees is placed in 100 grams of water at 22 degrees contained in a calorimeter. The metal and the water come to the same final temperature of 24.6 degrees. What is the specific heat of the metal? So I'm going to change over to my other camera. Okay, and here is our problem. So there's the problem there. So um, basically we have um, uh, the Q of the metal um, plus the Q of the water is equal to zero. Another way you'll see that written sometimes is the Q of the metal is equal to the opposite of the Q of the water. That's simply moving that to the other side. I like this form of the equation only because it highlights the fact that the, the magnitude of these heats is the same. What's different is the sign. So um, the sign of that the one is is uh, giving off heat, the other is gaining heat. Um, but Q is also mass um, times specific heat times delta T. So we can say that the mass of the metal times the specific heat of the metal times the delta T of the metal um, is equal to the opposite of the mass of the water times specific heat of the water times the delta T of the water. So that's, an, that's one way of, of doing that. Um, you can simplify this. We're trying to solve for the specific heat. So we can simply divide both sides by the mass of the metal times the heat uh, change in temperature of the metal. So C of the metal is equal to the opposite of mass of the water times specific heat of the water times delta T of the water divided by mass of the metal times delta T of the metal. Um, so I've just manipulated the equation without putting any numbers into it. So let's see what some of these numbers are. Um, delta T for the water 
is equal to the final temperature, which is 24.6 degrees Celsius, minus the initial temperature for the water, which is 22 degrees Celsius, put the zero in there. Um, that equals uh, 2.6 degrees. That's the delta T for the water. Delta T for the metal is the initial was 80 degrees. So the final temperature is 24.6 degrees Celsius minus 88, oh, excuse me, 80 degrees Celsius. Um, and that equals, let's see, we did this. This is minus 55.4 degrees Celsius. So now we can put some of those numbers in. And we can say that the heat capacity of the metal is equal to the opposite of the mass of the water, which was 100 grams, times 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, that's the heat capacity of water, times uh, 2.6 degrees Celsius, divided by the mass of the metal, which was, uh, what was that, 70 grams. Um, times the change in temperature of the metal, which is a minus 55.4 degrees Celsius. Notice now that we have a negative here and a negative here. So those are gonna cancel and we'll end up with a positive number, which we should. Heat capacities should never be negative. Heat capacities should always be positive. So what we end up with is 0 0.281 joules per gram degrees Celsius. So that is um, the first problem on that uh, slide. I have, as I said, I've posted the, the answers to the other two and I would like you guys to uh, try those other problems. Okay, so we'll go back to our PowerPoint. Okay, so um, in this second one, I'll just say one thing. In this second one, um, how many milliliters of water at 23 degrees Celsius with a density of one gram per milliliter? So you're going to end up giving a volume as your answer, um, but you do the problem with grams because the, the um, equations require mass, so you'll need the density of water. Um, must be mixed with 180 milliliters or about six ounces of coffee at 95 degrees so that the resulting combination will have a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. You don't have to use the heat capacity in this case because the heat capacity will be considered the same. The heat capacity of water will be considered, will be the same as the heat capacity of the uh, coffee, so you can simplify that and leave the heat capacity out because it will ultimately be the same. Um, and in this last one, I, it's very much like the first one, except instead of giving you uh, the heat, asking you to solve for heat capacity, we're asking you to calculate the final temperature. Um, the heat capacity of copper is given here. Uh, heat capacity of copper is 0.385, so you can use that. And I did challenge you here, can you solve this equation, which is the basically the equation that we were using, can you solve that for T, -T final? Because that ultimately is what you're going to have to have to do um, in this problem. I will point out that you're going to have a ma mass and heat capacity. You'll be able to reduce that to one number for the metal and one number for the water. You can carry that through, distribute that through, uh, multiplying it times T final and T initial, and you should be able to do that. So, um, Professor? Yes. Um, just a quick question for number two. Mm -hmm. Does the um, volume there, does it become the uh, mass? Well, it does because water okay. is one gram per milliliter. Use it. You 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 can use 
you'll use mass. You'll calculate how much mass of water has to be added. Yeah. Um, and then use the, the this because it's one gram per milliliter that will be, you can convert that to mass. Um, you can use 180 milliliters of water. You can assume the density there is also one gram per milliliter. Okay. So you yeah, can make use, sense. use that as mass. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about calorimetry. Um, when the sort when the heat source is a reaction. In other words, if you're mixing two solutions that are going to undergo a reaction, like a, either a precipitation reaction would work or an acid base reaction would work, um, the mathematical process is exactly the same, but the solution in the calorimeter is what's going to change uh, temperature. So let's look at the parts of a calorimeter. Very often, in chemistry class, you'll be given two nested uh, styrofoam cups, and that's what this picture shows, because the styrofoam cups, just like uh, you get your coffee in at Dunkin' Donuts or uh, Starbucks, if you happen to prefer Starbucks, those, if you, I guess Starbucks doesn't use styrofoam, but those styrofoam cups are essentially insulated enough that they will keep your coffee hot for a period of time. They are not 100% efficient. If they were, your coffee would stay hot forever, but it does. they do lose heat. Um, that's why you have the lid on it because that heat would end up uh, dissipating much quicker if it was open. But a standard calorimeter would be two nested styrofoam cups to, to try to provide a little bit more insulation and a cover, you have a stirrer to mix the contents of your reaction. If you're mixing two solutions that are gonna undergo a reaction, you want the reaction, you want those solutions mixed so the reaction occurs uh, more readily. Um, and then a temperature, a thermometer to measure the change in temperature. Um, and the, Q, the, the, the reaction, the heat that is either given off or absorbed by the reaction that is occurring is going into the solution in the calorimeter. So the heat of the reaction is it plus the mass of the solution times the heat capacity of the solution times the change in temperature of the solution has to equal zero. Or as I said before, we can calculate the heat of the reaction is equal to the opposite of the mass of the solution times the heat capacity of the solution, times the change in temperature. Um, remember that the mass of the solution here has to include all components of the solution, um, which will come up in problems that we do in a bit. Um, and the other, uh, the other piece is that the heat, the other thing I was almost lost the thought for a moment, but the heat capacity of the solution in general, because these are aqueous solutions, the in general, the heat capacity of the solution can be assumed to be the same as the heat capacity of water. Most of the reactions are done at low enough concentration that it, the heat capacity of water is appropriate. Occasionally, the heat capacity of the solution might be different uh, maybe it's too concentrated or something like that. So uh, in those instances, you would have to be given the heat capacity of the solution. You would have to be told what to use as a number there. But for the most part, um, you would just use 4.184, which is the heat capacity of water. Um, so we have, um, uh, again, we have some problems here that we can do. Um, I think that I have... Uh, intentions of doing this first one. Um, let's see. Yes. So we will do this first one. Uh, in a react, if a reaction produces 1.506 kilojoules of heat, which is trapped in 30 grams of water initially at 26.5 degrees Celsius in a coffee cup calorimeter, what is the resulting temperature of the water? So we will change the Camera. Okay, so 
we said, I did not, I unfortunately didn't write this problem down here, but we had 1.506 kilojoules um, is our Q. Um, and we would actually convert that to joules. So it's 1,506 kilojoules, uh, excuse me, 1,506 joules. And remember that the Q um, of your reaction um, plus the Q of the water equals zero. Um, so we're gonna say that 1,506 joules for the reaction plus the Q of the water, and um, the water was 30 grams times the heat capacity of water, which is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, times the change in temperature of the water, um, which is T final minus 26.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and we're asked that has to equal zero. The Q of the reaction plus the Q of the water equals zero. Um, so we're going to solve this for T final. Um, and when you do, let's see, we can simplify this to uh, 4,832.3 joules. I'm actually going to multiply these two numbers together and distribute them through times T final times uh, the 26. So that's how I end up with this number. This equals uh, 125.5 joules per degree Celsius times T final. Um, Basically, I multiplied these two numbers together and I end up with um, 125.5, which I multiply times T final. I also multiplied it by 26.5 degrees Celsius and then move that to the other side. So when I solve this, I get 38.5 degrees Celsius is equal to our T final. Um, so that's what the temp final temperature will be. Okay, um, oops, I'll go over here instead. Um, so that's that first one. Um, I will point out uh, in this second one, uh, when you add 3.21 grams of solid ammonium nitrate and dissolve it in water, you're dissolving it in 50 grams of water, um, in a calorimeter, the temperature decreases to 20.3 degrees Celsius. Determine Q and explain the meaning of its sign. I've given you what you should end up with as Q, but I have not given you the answer to that second question. You have to think about that yourself. I will point out to you that it is the heat, you have to determine, um, the when you do this, you have to determine the mass of the solution and the most common error, students forget to add the mass of the ammonium nitrate to the mass of the water. So the mass of this solution is actually 53.21 grams. It's not 50 grams. Once you've put that ammonium nitrate into the calorimeter, it adds to the mass. It's the entire system that comes to thermal equilibrium, including that ammonium nitrate. And you'll also notice on question three, uh, I have given you the answer to part B. I want you to think about part A and part C and answer those yourself. If you have any questions, by all means, let me know. Okay, so that was a coffee cup calorimeter, um, but there's actually another type of calorimetry um, that is used, um, and that's a bomb calorimeter. And this is used to measure um, uh, enthalpy change or excuse me, energy changes or heat changes when you're um, dealing with um, very large amounts of heat, especially with combustion reactions. Um, you couldn't imagine doing a combustion reaction in a styrofoam coffee cup. You'd have to do it in a system that is a bomb calorimeter. Um, so 
Um, let me talk about the parts of the bomb calorimeter. Essentially, you have a sample cup here, and your sample is in that cup. Um, uh, you have uh, an oxygen inlet that will provide this solution, this uh, calorimeter with oxygen so that you can combust your sample. You have electrodes that will actually um, ignite the sample. Um, and it's all uh, encased in uh, a jacket that contains water. So um, the reaction that's going on inside this sample container is actually releasing heat and that heat is being absorbed by the, the water. Uh, you have a precision thermometer that measures the change in temperature of the water and this entire system comes to thermal equilibrium. Um, but notice that in the last calorimeter we had um, really the majority of the heat is just being absorbed by this, the, the water in this system. Technically you also have the stirrer and the thermometer, but um, for the most part, the energy is uh, being uh, released into the, the water. In this case, you have a lot of different parts. You have the metal jacket that this entire thing is encased in. You have um, the, the thermometer. You have, you have a lot of different parts made of different materials. And those materials all absorb heat at different rates. So it's very difficult to um, measure the, 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 uh, how the energy changes in this system. Notice that I have the Q of the reaction um, plus the Q of the water, but I also have to add this term, which is Q of the bomb itself. So the bomb itself is going to absorb some heat. And I have to account for that in this kind of a calorimeter because that is a more significant piece than it would be in the other calorimeter. So I need those three terms. Um, the water surrounding the bomb in this chamber is the same, is gonna be calculated the same way that you did before. The mass of the water times the heat capacity of the water times the change in temperature of the water. But Q sub B or the heat, or the heat of, that's absorbed by the bomb, there are multiple parts there and they all absorb heat differently. So that is generally calculated for each calorimeter and it has to be determined every single time you use the calorimeter. So it, that's, that we call that calibration. Your, your bomb calorimeter has to be calibrated. And it really is done as a heat capacity for that bomb times the temperature change for the bomb. So the mass, it's not a specific heat, it's a heat capacity. It's not specific heat is per gram. This is a heat capacity. So it's a heat capacity of the bomb times the change in temperature of the bomb. And so we can actually, as, as before, we can move these two terms to the other side and say the Q of the reaction is equal to the opposite of the Q of the water minus the Q of the bomb. And we can substitute in for that. Sometimes, Sometimes the Q of the water and the Q of the bomb are collected together as one term. And it would be given as Q sub C, which stands for Q of the calorimeter. And that's where you would add, all, all of that would be added as one term. And that is calculated as the heat capacity of the calorimeter times the change in temperature of the calorimeter. Um, so sometimes this whole term here can be simplified this way. And that's if you add them together. Um, but they have to be, when, when you do it that way, it has to be measured each time you use the calorimeter. So um, I have a couple of practice problems here. Um, I'm, we, we, uh, I'm not really gonna take the time to do it. Um, 
for you, but I'd like you to try them. I've given you the answers here. Um, notice that uh, 0.963 grams of benzene is burned in a bomb calorimeter. The temperature of the calorimeter rises by 8.39 degrees. So we've just given you the change in temperature. We haven't given you initial and final, we've given you the total temperature change. The bomb has a heat capacity of 784 joules per degree Celsius. So this is Q sub, uh, this is the heat capacity um, for the bomb. This is, is C sub B and the temperature change would be 8.39 for everything. And it's submerged in 925 milliliters of water. So you're gonna to have to do the water separately here. Again, use water as one gram per milliliter to get the mass of the water. Um, in the second problem here, I have given you um, the calorimeter and its contents are added together uh, as uh, a heat capacity of 9.90 kilojoules per degree Celsius. So I've given you an example, one where you have to calculate the water and the bomb separately, and one where the heat capacity is combined. So you can practice those. Okay, so chemical thermodynamics deals with the relationships between heat and work. Remember we said that um, energy is the capacity to, uh, to release heat or to do work. So other forms of energy in contact, it's, it's basically heat and work in, um, and other forms of energy in the context of chemical and physical processes. So um, both physical processes and chemical processes can be used to either produce heat or to do work. Um, the internal energy of a system is represented by U. I will very often use an E, a capital E here. Your book indicates that it can be either U or E. I tend to use E, so if I, if I forget and use, your book uses U, I think. So if I forget, just be aware that um, E is, it stands also for internal energy. And the internal energy for a system is the sum of all of the energies of all of the particles, both potential energy and kinetic energy for every particle in the system. So calculating the energy of a system is very difficult. What we can do relatively easily is calculate the change in energy of a system. The change in energy of a system is equal to the sum of the work and the heat, either the, the heat either done by the system or done on the system, and the work either done by the system or on the system. So delta U, change in energy of a system, is equal to the sum of the heat plus the work. This is known as the first law of thermodynamics. We'll get into the second law and the third law in second semester, but this is the first law of thermodynamics. The most difficult or the, the most common mistakes made in thermodynamics is sign errors. And what we need to do is remember that you are always considering work and heat from the point of view of the system. Now, this might be different for heating engineers. Heating engineers are more concerned with the surroundings. How well is the surround, are the surroundings being heated? But for chemists, we're concerned about the energy of the system itself. So we basically divide the world or the universe into two parts, the system under consideration and then everything else. Everything else is the surroundings. We carry out um, all of these uh, energy changes in calorimeters because calorimeters allow us to limit the surroundings. Um, we don't want to have to consider energy, how that energy is affecting the entire universe. We want to keep that 
as confined as possible. So we divide the universe into system and surroundings and we limit our surroundings by using an insulated calorimeter. So um, the change of, um, if Q is is leaving the system, if the if it's an exothermic reaction, then Q is being removed from the system, and Q must be negative. Q is less than zero. If heat is flowing into our system, if it's an endothermic reaction and heat is flowing into our system, then Q has to be greater than zero. And that's probably the single biggest problem for students to keep in mind. Exothermic means Q is negative. Endothermic means Q is positive. And that is because we are focusing on the system. For work, work that is done by the system, again, energy is flowing out of the system. So if the work is doing, if the system is doing work on the surroundings, then the work is negative. If work is being done on the system by the surroundings, then work is positive. That's because we're focusing on the system. So uh, we could calculate the change in internal energy for a system undergoing uh, an endothermic process. Endothermic process means that energy is flowing into the system. So it is uh, a positive 15.6 kilojoules and where work is being done on the system, so that is energy flowing into the system of 1.4 kilojoules. So in this case, delta U would equal 15.6 kilojoules plus 1.4 kilojoules, which is equal to 17.0 kilojoules. So our system in this case has gained 17 kilojoules of energy. So let's think about um, the table below, providing the sign for delta U in each case, if we can. Um, in, um, if, if we'll do Q first and then W. If we have an endothermic process, energy or heat is flowing into the system, so um, Q is positive. W is work being done by the system, so work is flowing out of the system, so work is negative. Delta U in this case really depends then on which of these two numbers is larger. Is Q larger than W or vice versa? So we really can't calculate delta U in this case, the sign of delta U is a question mark. It depends upon which of those is larger. For an exothermic process, Q is negative. Heat is flowing out of the system in an exothermic process. If work is being done by the system, it's also negative. So in this case, delta U, we can say that delta U is gonna be negative. If we have an endothermic process, again, and heat is flowing into our system, work done on the system, that is a positive work, then delta U is also positive. So we can determine it there. In this case, an exothermic process, heat is flowing out of the system. Um, Work is also, is, is work is being done on the system. So work is flowing into the system. So delta U, we don't know. Again, it depends upon the, the interplay between those two, which is larger. Professor, why can't we tell between the work done by the system in endothermic and the work done on the system in exothermic again? Why can't we determine delta U in these two cases? Because it depends upon whether, remember that this is Q plus W. Delta U equals Q plus W. Which is bigger, the positive number or the negative number? That's going to determine what the sign of delta U is. 
if heat is bigger, then in this case, it'll delta U will be positive. But if the work is bigger, that negative number is going to be bigger than delta U would be negative. Same thing is true here. When these two signs are in opposition to, of, e of each other, you need to know which is bigger, Q or W, to determine which is going to be, which sign delta U is going to be. Professor? Yes. So every time um, work is done on a system is always positive, like the, um, the work is always positive? The work is positive if work is done on the system. Okay. Um, and we'll talk about um, we'll talk about work uh, specifically forms of work in a bit, and and you'll see what what we mean by work um, being done on the system. Okay, so um, this is um, pressure volume work. This is one of the more common uh, forms of work in chemical systems. Um, when you have a flammable gas and it combusts in a, pi a piston. Um, heat is produced. This is how your internal combustion engine works. Um, but uh, pressure is produced, which actually pushes back on the piston, and that's work. So the gas expanding is the gas doing work on the surroundings. So in this case, work is positive. Work is is being done by the system onto the surroundings. Think of a, a gas in a, in a balloon. If you were to put pressure on the outside of that balloon and try to, to uh, press back on the volume and shrink that um, balloon, you're actually doing work on the balloon. You're trying to compress the balloon. And in doing so, you're going to um, uh, shrink the volume and increase the pressure inside the balloon. In that case, work is being done on the system. Professor, so, can you go back to the chart real quick? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. So um, the expansion work that is being done by the system is, is it, the pressure times the change in volume. So the pressure on the, 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 the Pressure within the system is pushing back against external pressure. So as this gas expands in this, in this piston, it's pushing back against whatever the pressure is on the other side of that piston. It's pushing back against that pressure, and it's changing the volume. If you think about that, pressure is a positive term, and the change in volume as the gas expands is also a positive term. So both pressure and change in volume are positive numbers. But we said that work, when the work is being done by the system on the surroundings, work has to be negative because energy is leaving your system. So that gets us to this equation work is equal to minus P delta V. The change in volume, pressing back against that pressure, these terms are all positive, but work has to be negative. So we have to stick that negative sign in front of it. Work, when we're talking about pressure volume work, work is always minus P delta V. So the change in internal energy only depends on the starting energy and the final energy values, um, not how it got there, but just what the initial value was and the final value. Anytime you have a quantity that is met, that only depends upon the initial state and the final state, that's called a state function. Neither Q nor W are state functions but delta U is, and let's see if I can explain why that is true. State functions are very common, but you can think about this path, the, these two paths from the base, if you have a base camp here and you arrive at the summit here, 
Um, the paths of these two hikers going up that mountain are very, very different. How they got there, the pathway is different, but their change in altitude is exactly the same. So while the path lengths are different, path lengths are not state functions, change in altitude is a state function. Displacement is another example of a state function. Pressure is a state function. Volume is a state function. So change in pressure doesn't matter how it's changed. It only matters where it started and where it ended up. Change in volume doesn't matter how it got there, just where it starts and where it finishes. Those are known as state functions. But Q and W are analogous to these pathways they are part of the pathway uh, of the change in energy within a system. Um, in physics, you talk about frictionless universe. Um, they'd always talk about uh, friction, the, these things happening in a frictionless universe. Um, that's because the work that you get out of the system um, you have to calculate the maximum work you can get and that's assuming that no energy is lost to heat. Friction um, causes you to lose some of that energy as heat. So the, 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 the less friction you have in your system, the more energy can be uh, provided to work. So Q and, and W are pathway quantities. Okay. Um, so we have, we're going to introduce a new thermodynamic quantity called enthalpy. Um, enthalpy is given a capital letter H. Uh, the reason it's not given capital letter E is because, as I said before, change in energy is often written as delta capital E. Your book uses delta U, but many texts use capital E. So we have to distinguish between energy and enthalpy. Um, enthalpy is defined as simply the internal energy of a system and its pressure volume product. All of these U, P, and V are all state functions. So enthalpy is going to be a state function. So we can say that a change in enthalpy is really just uh, the in, uh, dependent upon its initial state and its final state. So delta H equals delta U plus delta PV product. So that's just based on the fact that it's a state function. So we're gonna start from there, delta H equals delta U plus P delta V. And we're gonna say in a situation where the pressure is constant, we can actually take that pressure out and say that because pressure isn't gonna change, what will change potentially is the volume. So delta H equals delta U plus P delta V. By definition, delta U equals Q plus W. So we can plug that in for delta U. But we just said that work in pressure, of, where we're talking about pressure volume work, work equals minus P delta V. So delta H equals Q plus W minus W because that's what work is. Um, so we end up with delta H equals Q sub P. And that's what happens in this type of calorimeter this is called a constant pressure calorimeter. As well as a coffee cup calorimeter. Either, either uh, name is, is valid. So under those conditions, what we're saying is the measure of enthalpy in this case is actually equal to Q. So if you can measure the heat of this, that, of this reaction in the calorimeter, you're actually getting a pretty good 
measure, you get, you're actually getting the measure of change in enthalpy, which is a, an approximation of the change in energy. The only term that you're not getting is P delta V, and there is very little volume change. You can, you can um, assume that in, in the reactions that you're doing in this kind of a, a calorimeter, there is very small volume changes in your system. So that uh, P delta V term is negligible. So in a constant pressure calorimeter, measuring the enthalpy is a good approximation of measuring the change in energy of your system. So delta H equals Q. So as long as you can measure the heat change, you're actually getting a good measure of the change in energy of your system. Technically it's delta H, it's change in enthalpy, but it's a pretty good approximation of change in energy. Um, that's because those kinds of reactions don't have large volume changes. In a bomb calorimeter, that is not true. In a bomb calorimeter, um, delta H does not equal Q. You also have to deal with the work term. So in other words, enthalpy is the heat flow when working at constant pressure. And that's generally what you're doing in the laboratory in a coffee cup calorimeter. So let's talk a little bit about enthalpy change and chemical equations. Um, Thermochemical equation, you, you can get, you'll get these delta enthalpy changes uh, off of tables or they'll be given to you in problems. A thermochemical equation shows the changes in both matter and energy. The energy corresponds to the equation as it's written. So in this case, one mole of hydrogen gas reacting with one half mole of oxygen gas producing one mole of liquid water is uh, accompanied with uh, minus 286 kilojoules of heat or delta H. It's generally written as delta H. Um, so what does the negative sign here mean? What does that mean when I say it's minus 286 kilojoules? Does that mean that it's endothermic? Remember the sign we're talking about. This is the system. If the system gives off heat, it's negative. If the system absorbs heat, it's positive. So in this case, it's giving off heat. So that means it's exothermic. Okay. So this reaction is accompanied with um, a release of heat. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever, if you in chemistry class, you ever tried uh, generating some hydrogen gas and then taking a glowing splint, you, you generate hydrogen gas in a test tube and you can take a glowing splint and stick that inside the test tube and you get a little squeaky pop when the uh, hydrogen gas uh, combusts, it's combusting with oxygen. That little noise that you hear, that little pop that you hear is um, the release of energy. So it is an exothermic reaction. Now, this enthalpy change is for the reaction as written, which means that if I, if, if I combust twice as much hydrogen, two moles of hydrogen plus one mole of oxygen to form two moles of water, then I'm going to release twice as much energy. This is not an intensive property. It is an extensive property. It matters how much of your reactants you are reacting. So the, if the coefficients change, you also have to change delta H. In this case, I have multiplied this, re, the first reaction has been multiplied by two. So I have to multiply by two here and I release twice as much energy. Notice if I change the state, hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas, and in this case, form water as a gas, then the enthalpy change is different. 
Okay, it is a different number if I change the states. And this has to be measured a different, it has to be measured again. You can't determine what that would be based on the original reaction. You would have to measure that again. So states matter. This is one of the reasons why I want you to write states when you write balanced chemical equations, because it matters when you come to thermochemistry, it's going to matter. So here are two examples of uh, heat of reaction and enthalpy. Um, the heat associated with a specific reaction um, can be determined from the molar enthalpy and vice versa. Um, notice that in that uh, in example one here, um, we have how, we ask the question: How much energy would you release from the combustion of four grams? of hydrogen with excess oxygen according to this equation be below. Well, the molar mass of hydrogen is, is two. Um, so uh, if you have um, uh, two times two, this is, this is four grams of hydrogen. So if you're combusting four grams of hydrogen, you're going to release 572 um, kilojoules. Um, in the second equation, um, when 0 0.05 moles of hydrochloric acid reacts with 0 0.05 moles of sodium hydroxide to form 0 0.05 moles of sodium chloride, 2.9 kilojoules of heat are produced. What is the enthalpy or delta H per mole of acid that reacts? All you need to do is take the 2.9 kilojoules and divide that by the number of moles that reacted here. It's 0 0.05 moles. And that will give you kilojoules per mole, um, which it ends up being 58 kilojoules per mole. Professor? Yeah. But the first one, did you use um, any equation to arrive at negative um, five? No, I, I'm sorry. I did it in my head. I basically said four grams of hydrogen. Four grams of hydrogen equals two moles because one mole of hydrogen is two grams. Okay. Okay. So um, this tells you that it's two moles. Now, if I asked you... How, uh, if I asked you how much energy would be released if you, if you combusted eight grams, um, you would have to double this, right? Because eight grams equals four moles. So you would have to double that and you would have to double the 572. Um, okay, so here is a practice problem. I kind of would like you guys to work on this for a little bit. Um, I'll give you a few minutes, uh, a couple minutes to work on it. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, and then we can do it as a group if you would like.
Can somebody tell me what the limiting reactant in this reaction was? Nobody? The hydrochloride. Does everybody agree with that? Can you show how we get that? Okay, let's see. All right. Um, you first have to figure out how many moles of each. So 1.34 grams of zinc times one mole is... 65.38 grams. That equals, and let's see if I can do that, 1.34 divided by 65.38. I get 0 0.0205 moles of zinc. To get moles of hydrochloric acid, it's 0 0.0600 liters times 0 0.75 molar, and I get 0 0.045 moles of HCl. Okay. I need two moles of HCl to react with one mole of zinc. Um, and I have X, so it looks to me like I have excess zinc. If I multiply this by um, one mole zinc to two moles HCl, Um, 0.045 divided by two, it's, um, that equals 0 0.0225. That will react with 0 0.0225 moles of zinc. And it's actually more than what I have. So I think the zinc is your limiting reactant. So zinc is going to react completely here and 3.14 kilojoules, four kilojoules divided by 0 0.0205 moles of zinc. And that's 153 kilojoules per mole. That's what I got. Does everybody understand how to do that? Um, I don't understand how you get to 153. Uh, 3.4 to 14 divided by 2, 0.0205. In other words, this is the amount of heat that was released in that reaction. Um, determine the enthalpy change per mole of zinc. Um, it's 153 kilojoules per mole because it's 3.14 kilojoules for 0 0.0205 moles. That's how many moles I calculated were in this reaction. Now notice that actually this is a negative 153. Why is it negative? And how do I know from the description that it is negative. Because heat is being produced as heat. exothermic. That's right. Heat are produced. 3.14 kilojoules of heat are produced. Um, I have a tendency because because 
sign errors are so common in thermodynamics and thermochemistry. They're very common. And so what I tend to do is I tend to do the math and then pay attention to what it says in the problem to determine whether it should be a negative sign or a positive sign. If it says heat is released or heat is produced, um, then I know that it's a negative sign. If I if it says heat is absorbed, I know it's a positive sign. So you have to get your clue from the re, from the wording of the problem whether your uh, your uh, reaction is endothermic or exothermic, um, and that tends to try that tends to minimize sign errors. Sometimes it's very hard. It's very it's very hard not to have sign errors in thermodynamics. Um, so I have a quick question. Sure. How is um, HCl, the limiting reactant here, if that's the bigger number? It's not the limiting reactant. Zinc is the limiting reactant. Um, zinc is the limiting I cal did the calculations in zinc because I this, this calculation tells me how many moles of hydrochloric acid I have. By comparing it to the moles of zinc, this tells me that this is how much zinc I could convert using that amount of hydrochloric acid, this is more than the actual zinc that I have. So zinc is the limiting reactant. Okay. Okay. Um, I think uh, we'll do this and then I'm going to let you do your quiz. Um, standard states, uh, many of these things have to be measured at standard states, or we have to determine what the standard states are. So the standard state is commonly accepted set of conditions used as a reference point, um, because thermochemistry, it, it, because everything depends upon state. Um, so we have to use a reference point. Um, and that reference point has been determined by IUPAC, which is the International Union of, of Pure and Applied Chemists. IUPAC has set the standard state um, as a pressure of one bar and solutions at one molar. In reality, most of the tables where you will get um, the, the values, they are reported at 25 degrees Celsius or 298 uh, Kelvin, and it's commonly reported at one atmosphere, which is 0.987 bars. So it's not quite uh, one bar. It, it's just that those are the more commonly used uh, pressures and temperatures. So the standard state enthalpy, when you get these values from tables, um, they are given as they're they're given as delta H, and it says 298. With that little zero, that little zero, like a little degree sign, that indicates that what you're looking at is a standard state enthalpy. Um, and the, those would be the values that are listed in the tables. Um, and we'll talk, we'll start uh, with the next slide um, in the next class. We're just about where I hoped we would be. And you guys can do your quiz on chapter Eight, it should be open. Of example, 131 grams of uh, hydrogen peroxide, but it's 50% concentration. Right. So I have the grams. Is that that's proper step, right? I'm sorry, I just have somebody waiting to get in. Okay, so is, is everybody here finished with the test? I don't know whether I'm... I'm... Yeah, uh, I think after one, nobody's allowed to take the test anymore. Okay. All right. Um, so let me pull it up. Okay, for test. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. Okay, so the last question is, is um, the stoichiometry question. Okay, so uh, hydrogen peroxide solutions explode. Okay, so you, the, you're asking what volume of gas. Uh, the solution is 50% hydrogen peroxide by mass. And you're given, everybody's given a different mass. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So whatever the mass you're given is for the solution. You have to multiply it by 0.5. Yeah. Okay. So we multiply that by 0.5. And that gives, that gives you the mass of hydrogen peroxide, which you then turn into moles. Mm -hmm. And then you use that to find uh, the volume using the ideal gas law. Yes, you well, you you you've got moles of of hydrogen peroxide. You convert that to moles of oxygen, right? You do that instantly. Uh, yeah, because you you in order to use the ideal gas law, you've got a temperature, you've got a pressure. Um, you need an N in order to get volume. Okay, so you need moles. I think I'd still get the same answer in the end. Yeah, so the problem is, um, I mean, uh, you, if you do the ratio like what I did, I just put the H2O2 into the ideal gas law and got the volume of H2O2 and then used the mole ratio because, you know, moles and volume are... Okay, well, see, what's technically wrong with the way you did it, I mean, you may get the same answer is you put you put moles of hydrogen peroxide in and got a volume for that. problem is hydrogen peroxide is not a gas. So the uh, ideal gas law only works for gases. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you'll take points off for that, but... <laughs> Depends, of, depends upon whether I'm in a good mood when I grade it. If I do the way that you said, um, mm -hmm. I still end up getting the same answer since uh, there's two moles of H2O2 per mole of right. oxygen. Right. You divide that by two. And uh, I just did the calculations uh, the way you did it, and I still end up with uh, half of the volume. That well, it, yeah, it, it, you're, you're, you're technically, and I understand that, then you will, because you will get the same answer, because you've put in a number of moles and calculated a volume for that many moles, and then you've said, okay, well, now I have a factor of two here, from the stoichiometry so I can change the volume of E. So you will, but you've made an assumption that is incorrect. And that assumption is that hydrogen peroxide behaves as a gas and it's not, it's aqueous. Okay. Um, so yeah. I just want, I just want you to be aware that in this particular case, because of the way the problem was set up, you may very well. And in fact, you will end up with the correct answer, but that is a flaw in your process that, under different circumstances could be a problem. Yeah. Okay. I'll definitely make sure to uh, not do that next time. But so calculate moles first. But um, I th like the problem is that we're here for is that um, I think the quiz answer is wrong. For what? For the one that we're talking about. Oh, uh, I don't know. I'll have to look at it because everybody has a different mass. So I'll check the formula. Okay. That's a, that's a formula question, and I had to put the formula in, so I'll double check it. Professor? Yeah. Um, I think what Roman was saying was that, um, I, I mean, I did it the way you said it, where we have like 50%, right? So that would be um, 50 grams of C2H2 divided by 100 grams of solution multiplied by... C2H2, C2H2 is H2O2. Wait, oh, sorry, H2O2? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's where I made a mistake. That's where I made the error. I wrote the wrong formula. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I just want to confirm, I'm sorry. You use the gram of the solution multiplied by 50%? Right. And then use that number to find the moles instead of find the moles of hydrogen peroxide. Yes, mm -hmm. the rest of it's water. Hydrogen peroxide is is a solution. It's 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 always um, in aqueous solution. So from yeah. there, are you supposed? Is that when you're supposed to do? Wait, I'm kind of confused. 
Okay, so if you're given a mass of solution, you're given a mass of hydrogen peroxide solution, it's an aqueous solution of hydrogen peroxide that is 50% hydrogen peroxide because it's mass mass, that means that if you have 100 grams of solution, you have 50 grams of hydrogen peroxide and 50 grams of water. So yeah. you take whatever mass of solution you were given and multiply it by 0.5, that's going to be the mass of hydrogen peroxide. Yeah. Okay. So I got up to there mm -hmm. and I, yeah, like I got the mass of hydrogen peroxide. Then I got moles. Was right. I supposed to do like mole ratio after that? Yeah. Because, the, because it's not one-to-one. -one. Uh, so yeah. I, yeah, I tried plugging that in instead, like just now, and I still didn't get the right answer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I did like half, about half. I'm off by like four. I think the answer is the answer without the mole ratio because it's double of my answer. I'll check it. I'll check to, to make sure that the, the formula was put in correctly. Okay, cool. Thank uh, you. Yeah, because I have the same issue. I got half of what it says it's supposed to. Okay, I'll double check and make sure the um, formula. It's, it's very possible that I put in the formula wrong. Actually, I realized what I did wrong. Professor. Yeah. I know that was so stupid of me to change the formula, though, but do I get partial credit? Of course you get partial credit. You, get a, math I you, get, a math, you get a math mistake from making a math error, which is one yeah. point. I will uh, see. I'm so sorry. Go. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Professor. Good day. Welcome.